I'm here to talk about how I've made some changes in our uh, WAS delivery process. Um, okay, got to Sorry, a little nervous. Um, like I said, my name is Mike Marable. I work for the uh, Michigan Medicine, the University of Michigan's uh, hospital health system. Um, I've been their OS deployment architect there for about just over 15 years now. Um, if you have any questions or you need to get want to get in touch with me, you ask me something after the fact. Uh, there's my email, uh, my Twitter. Um, I put in, putting together a, a GitHub, so like the the scripts and things uh, that I have that, I, that I'm using. Once I get them scrubbed of uh, our, our company information, I'm going to get them uploaded into that that GitHub repository. Um, and I'm one of the, the writers for Chris Buck's uh, CCM F12 Twice group, so uh, you'll find some of my blog posts there. So, what am I here for? Um, I'm going to be talking about how I've made the changeover from using the in-place upgrade task sequences to using feature updates. And uh, it's my cute little dog there. I was hoping to gain some brownie points with a cute puppy picture. Um, but it's true. For years now, I've been I've been on board with using the in-place upgrade task sequence, um, and I spent uh, countless meetings and discussions at, at at work trying to convince everybody: No, you don't want to use servicing plans. You want you know they're not flexible enough. You got to use the IPU task sequence. It's just it's just not going to work. And in fact, at MMS. Uh, it's about two years ago, back in 2018, no, 2019, um, I did a presentation with, with Kaido on Windows as a Service in the Enterprise, and sure enough, right there on our summary slide, I told people, don't use servicing plans. Well, I've had to, like I said, eat some crow, and I've had to go back and have the same discussions with the managers and leadership where I work that I've convinced we got to use in-place upgrade task sequences, that we wanted to switch over to using feature updates. So why did I have to do that? Well, COVID is what done it has what's done it for us. Um, when COVID came rolling through back last spring, um, the, the University of Michigan, the Michigan Health System, but pretty much everybody started sending everybody to work from home. Uh, so the vast majority of our our staff was now working from home, and that came right as we were wrapping up our 1809 IPU task sequence upgrade. I can evolve, you know, our Win10 machines up to 1809. And it then, you know, that then proposed, that then presented a whole bunch of problems for us because we didn't have a cloud management gateway. So, you know, now that we can run task sequences through a cloud management gateway, well, we don't have that. Uh, we don't have Intune, so we can't do anything with co-management. And our VPN solution is a on-demand VPN connection, so it's not it's not always on. So, and to add insult to injury, our networking team has imposed uh, time limits for how long you can maintain a connection of the VPN. Um, it's like 10 hours, and at 10 hours, it will drop the connection. Doesn't matter if you use it or not. In fact, learned it the hard way. It just dropped the connection on me right in the middle of of a meeting one you know when we first started this. So we have a lot of machines that are going to be off in a in a state essentially disconnected from our SECM environment. And trying to get our task sequence to do an in-place upgrade running reliably over a, a, our, our VPN connection wasn't wasn't really in the works. Um, it, it, it didn't work out for us. So we had to come up with a different way of doing things. So I'm still a big, big proponent of when I call it the, the the big bank was way of doing things. The, the fundamentals that that Mike and Gary have, have talked about, you know, throughout their entire, you know, the entire was road trip that they've had. Those fundamentals are are you know still um, pertinent regardless of what your delivery method is, whether it's your upgrade is going to be done with a, with a task sequence or a feature update, or if you're going to hand somebody a DVD, the, the thought process that goes into it is still rock solid. Catch machines that are going to be problematic and address them before you even attempt to do an upgrade. 
So that's we're ninety nine percent of our WAS process is still the same. Uh, we still have a multi phase approach, and all we're really changing is you know the last couple of pieces at the tail end of the of the journey of the actual delivery. Um, I've, for us, I've split it up into a four phase process instead of, you know, the, the, the three phase that we had with our 1809. And that's just simply to make things a little easier as far as reporting goes and, um, you know, presenting the numbers to, to leadership uh, where I work. Uh, also, we don't turn on this thing and just start running machines through it. We, we actually turn this on in phases. So what we'll do is the, the very first phase, we'll, we'll turn it on, we will run all the machines through it make sure everybody has kind of a warm and fuzzy feeling about where things stand and how the numbers look before we then move them the whole group onto the next phase. So I kind of liken it to um, a race weekend. If you're an auto race fan, you know, Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, doesn't matter. Uh, essentially when a team shows up you know, at the racetrack, the first thing they'll do is they'll go through scrutineering and it's just where they, um, the cars are checked to make sure that they meet the rules. Nobody's broken any rules. And that's exactly how the approach I've taken. So the very first, the phase zero, the scrutineering phase um, that I've tacked on at the beginning of this is I'm looking to weed out the machines that I'm never gonna upgrade. You know, we've we've closed the door on Windows 7. So, you know, we don't want any of our desktop support teams trying to shove a Windows 7 machine in there. Um, we don't wanna have any current Win 10. So right now we're, starting our 1909. We don't want to send a 1909 machine through the entire process, wasting time and effort on it, only to find out when it comes time to run the update, it's already current. But the big thing is the catching our unsupported hardware. Um, you know, there, we dropped about a half dozen models that we used to support on 1809 that we're no longer supporting on 19. So we want to be able to catch those machines. Um, we have some people who've put together some, you know, SQL reports that are just real simple that just present uh, these collection memberships in a, in a web report. So the desktop support teams can, you know, drill into the report, look at, you know, the ineligible unsupported hardware, and they can see, okay, these are the computers that are running on hardware that's going to have to be replaced. So if a machine makes it through this process, this phase, and it's, it's past all the, the scrutineering rules, it moves into pre-assessment. So this starts to kind of get back into the, the traditional WAS uh, process that most people are, might be familiar with. Pre-assessment, you start looking for machines that have uh, a transient problem, something that if it's fixed, they can move on. Machines that are low on disk space. Uh, machines that haven't, Active Directory hasn't seen them in two weeks. We want to kind of get a hold of those and find out what's going on with them. Uh, machines that haven't, reported hardware inventory to SEC in, in several days. We want to find those machines, see if they're still legitimate, see if they're still out there, you know, talk to the users, tell them, look, you really need to get these machines, get the laptops out of the cabinet drawers, put them online, you know, we, we need to be able to see those things now and then. Makes it through this process, it gets into the pre-staging. So this is the, like the roughly the equivalent of what's the uh, compact scan, um, might have been in, in the IPU sequence phase. Here, the point of this phase for us is getting the content that the feature update is gonna need down onto the workstation. Because the, a feature update will function completely independent and disconnected from Config Manager. And that's the big draw for us to be making this move to it. So we can get to these machines that are, you know, in work from home environments where the VPN is, you know, dropped and they have no connectivity back to the home office. And a feature update can do that. But for a feature update to do that, it has to have everything it's going to need accessible. So we have a, a pre-staging sequence that copies all the, the content we're going to need there. And, you know, our, the scripts that we need, the updated driver packages, um, anything we have to reinstall. And I'll get into details of that, that actual sequence here coming up. Once it's successfully completed that pre-staging sequence, um, we're up and running and ready to go with deployments. And the deployments, we're gonna funnel them into one of two categories. The vast majority are gonna be automated and they're gonna be randomly peppered throughout, you know, three, four months worth of deployments. Um, but we, we're a health system, so we have um, 
some highly critical machines that you don't want to trust to just scheduling them automatically. Things like you don't want to be, you know, upgrading a machine that's in use in an operating room. So you don't want to be um, taking chances with machines in the emergency department, that sort of thing. So those get funneled into a manual deployment collection. And from there, the desktop support teams responsible for those areas will work out with the, the end user uh, community there to schedule times to go in there and, and manually pull them. All right, so how is this all actually going to work and come together for us? Um, I'm going to make a plug for Adam Gross. He's written some great blog articles that have goes into great detail of how these different components all work. And it's how I got started with working on all this, making this all work for us. And I will say I stole with pride a lot of his code. So I'm going to put him on the spot. OK, regardless of how a setup, oh, I'm sorry, regardless of how an upgrade is performed, whether it's a IPU sequence, it's a feature update, it's a DVD, it's the, the update wizard, you know, downloaded from Microsoft, it's going to run setup. So the first piece of this puzzle is an INI file, which is just an answer file that's going to pass parameters to, to this to setup. And this location here, users default app data local, that's the default location that Microsoft has encoded setup to look for. So if this file exists and a user drops on a DVD and they just run setup, setup is, is coded to look for this file. And then these parameters are then passed to, you know, automatically to the, to, um, uh, to the setup engine. The two that I want to point out are the third from the last and the very last, uh, the post UB and install drivers. Post UB um, is instructing setup that once the out of box experience completes at the end of the entire update to run this batch file. Yes, it's a batch file, but it can call PowerShell scripts, it can it can run VB scripts, it can run anything. It's just going to be a jumping point to running anything you need to do. This script is going to be doing most of the heavy lifting um, of taking over the workload of what used to be in the IPU task sequence. The install drivers, that's where setup can find the plug and play drivers um, that it's going to need. So if you go from 18, 1809 to 1909, we've downloaded and set up new drivers in this folder hanging off the C drive, and that's where um, set up and find them for plug and play. Next up, custom actions. These are with 1909 and before uh, three batch files, failure, pre-commit, and pre-install that setup is configured to look for natively. And it'll look for them in, you know, see Windows System 32 update, and if they're in run, um, they will get migrated along with your operating system. If they're run once, once they're executed, they're essentially thrown away. Um, you can bury them inside of a, a, a subfolder of a GUID. This way you can have them separated out. You can, I suppose you can get, uh, you can get fancy and have separate GUIDs for, you know, there's the, the main one for all your machines, another GUID for, you know, particular departments, uh, particular location. You, you could probably get pretty creative with that and have multiple sets of these. But the way it works is at the very beginning of the, the feature update, setup will automatically run, look for, and execute that pre-install.cmd batch file. And that'll be executed at the very beginning of, of the upgrade process. Um, so if you had anything in your in-place upgrade task sequence that you were running um, beforehand, uh, before the upgrade was, was processed, this would be where you would want to place those. Pre-commit. Once the down level, all the background work is done and the machine is ready to reboot, the update is automatically going to run if it finds it that pre-commit script. And in the case of a failure, it'll automatically run that failure command. Um, in our case, we have set up diag in, into the failure uh, CMD script. So if, a, if an update fails, it'll automatically run set up diag, collect up all the logs. Um, in 2004 and newer, Microsoft has added a success.cmd, which could essentially take the place of that uh, setup complete post UB action in the uh, setup config INI. Okay, setup complete. So at the very end of the entire upgrade process, 
this is where all the the, the grunt work is going to be done. Um, in our case, so there's the setup complete. Again, it's a batch file, but it can easily call PowerShell scripts, executables, VB scripts, anything else. So in our case, the setup complete, um, I've written a small little PowerShell script, post upgrade fixes, where all of the actions that we had in the post upgrade portion of our IPU task sequence, I've ported them all over to this PowerShell script. So then, um, for example, there's a home, homegrown application that we have to reinstall. It doesn't survive the upgrade, so we have to uninstall it and reinstall it. I have the, the code in that post upgrade fixes PowerShell script to do that. Now the binaries that it would need, I have them downloading into that Windows 10 tweaks folder. And all this gets put down as part of the, the pre-staging task sequence that we're using. And then finally, I have it calling a second PowerShell script, the unified drivers install, which just goes through and installs helper applications, uh, trackpad, uh, applets, hotkey software, things like that, that uh, um, we're in HP shop that different, particularly HP laptops require. So when you put it all together, th this is the, essentially the uh, cliff note version of the chain of events. The upgrade gets triggered, whether it's uh, the user initiated or the mandatory kicks off. The first thing it does is it runs the, the custom action for the pre-install. Now in our case, uh, we uh, write a bunch of information to a, a, a key under HP local machine system um, that has a lot of information about the workstation, uh, what department it belongs to, what uh, support groups responsible for, what building, its location, things like that. Normally in an upgrade, that key gets wiped out. So in our task sequence, at the very beginning, we would back it up. So with the feature update, the pre-install command pull, uh, runs a PowerShell script that backs up that, uh, that registry key for us. The upgrade process is in the background. Users can continue to go about their business, do everything they would normally be doing, while the upgrade does all of its work behind the scenes. When it's ready to reboot, the uh, pre-commit is set to run. Sorry about that. Neighbor suddenly fired up a table saw. Um, okay. When it's ready to reboot, it'll kick off the uh, pre-commit batch file. And in our case, we have it calling a um, application we've written to notify the user you need to reboot. It offers some deferrals, a countdown timer, that sort of thing. Uh, we use that instead of the native um, config man reboot notifications. System reboots, runs out of box. When that completes, uh, the post UBI option in the setup complete or setup config INI tells it to run our setup complete script, which restores the department key, which is that uh, registry key we back up there in step number two. Uh, runs post upgrades, so it sticks back our active setup components, puts back all of our corporate branding. Um, fires off the, uh, the PowerShell script to do the reinstall of the helper apps and uh, reinstalls our local workstation or that, that local utility we have that, um, that doesn't survive. So essentially everything you were doing in an IPU task sequence can be ported over to these various scripts to do it. So like I said, everything's got to be on the machine for it to accomplish this. And you got to pre-stage all the content. Uh, the pre-staging task sequence, um, ours is kept pretty simple. Um, I just got the little collapse version of it there. Um, the first thing it does is it runs, and uh, the first thing it'll do is it'll write the setup config INI. And again, this is one of the scripts I stole from Adam. Um, it's a nifty little script. It writes the, the, the setup config INI file. You can run it. In a, in a task sequence like we're doing, you could run it as a standalone application. You can do a, a configuration item for it. Um, you know, there's all sorts of uh, options for you to, as running that. Uh, next, I'm going to go through. I'm going to copy down all of my custom files, the, the binaries to reinstall that homebrew application, uh, all the scripts it needs, the custom action scripts, uh, my PowerShell scripts, the setup complete. You know, copy all that to the local workstation. Then I I've have it set up so that if it needs to, it'll download the drivers, that would, or the driver package it would do. And I'll 
talk about that in a moment here. Um, it uninstalls the universal apps. Uh, we were before just blocking them with app locker policies. Uh, one of the problems we ran into though was that after an upgrade, the app locker policies would prevent the universal apps from updating. So what we would have would be a bunch of uh, broken AppX applications stuck down at the bottom of the start menu. So we just went back to during this uninstalling those applications that we're going to be blocking. Uh, this line about checking our local workstation database. Um, we have a database where we keep all of our um, uh, workstation information. Again, who's responsible for the machine, what buildings are located. Uh, we have in there a, um, a field if the machine has any kind of security hold, whether it's uh, being investigated as part of a security breach or involved in any kind of legal legal matters or things like that. So we just call out, make the look up, and if it does, we then uh, uh, control fail the task sequence and we shunt it on off. So again, because of uh, it's an external database, we kind of have to do this. We, we wouldn't be able to do this over a cloud management gateway, essentially. Okay, drivers and the hash checks. Back in late August, I kind of did a small presentation about this. Um, and uh, Chris Buck then posted on Twitter, hey, everybody, ask Mike about his hash stuff. And I started getting, I started getting requests for all sorts of things outside of the world of IT at that point. So I thought I would at least explain it here, how I got things working. Since most of our machines are now off-site, laptops at home, I don't want to chew up bandwidth by repeatedly downloading um, uh, the, the driver packages day after day after day. Um, we do run our pre-staging task sequence on a daily basis. Uh, one, so that if we do have any changes, let's say a, a new driver package, or two, a machine does suddenly get a security hold placed upon it, we can still catch it. So we are running pre-staging on a daily basis. So I don't want to download a gig, 1.2 gig or 1.5 gig driver package every single day down somebody's home um, internet connection. To do that, um, our driver packages are just single driver. Um, all the drivers are zipped up into a, a zip file and that's the content of the package. We download it, decompress the zip file. We'll start comparing hash values. So one thing I will say, you don't want to try to generate a hash of a gig, a gig and a half file across the internet. That's in testing, it was taking longer to generate the hash than it would actually download the file. So what I've, as part of the payload of all the scripts and custom actions and things like that that we need, I have this small little CSV that just matches up the driver package ID with the um, the the checksum hash value. So what I have in the task sequence is I have just a simple PowerShell script that looks to see if it'll generate the hash value of the driver.zip file that was already on the local machine, looks it up in that CSV file, see, and if they don't match, it decides it's going to have to download it, you know, an updated one, and it sets a task sequence variable the need to download sets it to true. If they match, um, it sets the need to download to false, and then it doesn't download it a second time, or a third time, or a fourth time, and so on. In the task sequence, it looks like this. I have a, uh, we're not using uh, um, admin portal or, or um, web services or things like that. We have a much more basic way of dynamically deciding what driver package is supposed to go, go down to a workstation. But we have a script that determines, looks up, this model is supposed to get, you know, CM100123. It then runs that script that was just on that pre previous slide, does the hash check, decides whether it needs to download it or not. If it does, it then runs this block of actions where it deletes what was existing, re-downloads the zip file, and decompresses it. The next day when it runs, the hash values will match and it skips over this whole block of code. Okay, 
We offer opt-ins, user opt-ins for our upgrades. Um, we're using uh, Martin Bergson's tow script two weeks prior to the feature updates deadline. Machines will start popping the toast notifications. If they, they decide to opt in and, and run it, it'll open up Software Center, drill directly down into the feature update where the user can hit install. Everything starts running in the background and, and the upgrade is performed. Uh, the slide I'm gonna come up to next here, um, I just have an animated GIF. Uh, down this left side is um, a central log that I have all my custom action scripts writing to. Um, just the intent of this is to kind of show the flow of once the upgrade, upgrade was started, pre-installs triggered. You know, I've cut out big sections of it here. Um, the pre-commit is going to fire. This was going to be this was before we did the uh, our custom notification. So the pre-commit fires. A couple of moments here. This is the native notifications that it would pop up for SCCM. And then it goes through, and, and like I said, it shows. If you want to see the whole thing, it, it'll go there. I don't want to run over here too much for everybody. OK. Lessons learned. Learn from my mistakes. Use software groups, software update groups for your deployments. 1909, over the last month, month and a half, has gone through two different revisions. Um, when we first set this up, we set up all of our mandatory deployments with just a direct deployment of the 1909 feature update. And then I think it was, I think it was mid to late October, um, Microsoft released an updated version of 1909. Uh, I think there was like a security vulnerability in the setup engine and they expired the existing 1909. Well, since that was what we had directly deployed, suddenly it vanished off of all of our machines. So that's when we made the switch over to using software update groups. Uh, the way they work, essentially you deploy the update group and then you can just swap in and out the different updates um, within that group. So when, uh, you know, two weeks or so ago when they Microsoft updated the 1909 feature update again, to address that uh, secure um, certificate issue, all you had to do was just put in the new soft, put in the updated 1909 feature update into the software update group and remove the old one. And since the software update group was what's deployed, you don't have to go recreating scores of deployments. The follow up to that though, is be careful when you make that switch. Because if you, for all of your mandatories that are place and available, when you make that switch uh, within the software update group, those machines are going to then start downloading the new content. You know, when essentially when they get to it, when they realize they got to download it. So what was happening in our case is we did that, you know, eight o'clock one morning. And by 9.930, the distribution point that also housed, housed our Pixie service point was getting clobbered by 27,000 machines that were all down, you know, or a portion of the 27,000 that were all downloading content. And the DP was serving up the content fine and ignoring Pixie requests. So, um, you know, again, learn from my mistakes. Don't swap these things out in the middle of the workday. Um, this probably go, it gets even more um, inconvenient if you start having uh, remote sites and you're dealing with nomad clients and things like that. Um, you don't want to start flooding your your WAN um, your WAN network because you made a swap of a, and suddenly machines are trying to download a three and a half four gig package over the WAN link in the middle of the, middle of a business day. So just be aware. Okay, some references. Like I said, Adam Gross has written some great blog articles that goes into great detail on how these different pieces work. Um, it's a great starting point. Um, if, if you haven't looked at feature updates, uh, the information he's got there is, a, like I said, a, a fabulous way to get started. Also in here is links to, uh, to Microsoft's uh, doc sites, um, you know, that talks about these same features and, and functionality. Um, 
great information there for it. And with that, does anybody have any questions? Mike, I'll start with one. I missed it earlier. It was from Gary Block. He threw it in the in the chat. Do you have the PowerShell script trigger the app install via the CM client? Yeah, you know, I thought about that a little bit more afterward. I'm like, well, he's offline, so he must not be doing it that way. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, all the all the reinstalls are are just straight like command lines. So like in this application that we have to reinstall the, the binaries are there. It's I stole the content from and it just oh, yeah. I took the call line that would the, the program was using in that package program and then the the PowerShell script just runs that. Yeah, I was just trying to think of a nice way to kinda leverage what CM already did so you wouldn't have to reinvent some of those app installs and whatnot, but you're in a unique situation. Yeah, unfortunately. I'm curious, how do you manage uh, service updates versus uh, updates? The, the feature update versus just a regular cumulative? No, uh, service updates. So, like, s some uh, client is so behind that you have to do the service update before you can do the other updates. Oh, well, I we don't have anything built into the process to handle something like that. Um, that's something I just learned today. I have not thought about that. Because some updates will not present themselves in, unless you do the service update first. Correct. Right. So. Yeah, I, I have not. I have not actually. The. I have not thought about handling that directly. I would think that if the machine has been, if the machine has been offline that long, that it's it's that far behind with the servicing stacks in the yeah, uh, pre-assessment portion. We, one of the things we check for is we have not, um, you know, we've not, SCCM hasn't seen that client in uh, 14 days. So if it's, well, if it's been offline like longer than that, we should catch it there. Well, if, it, if it's been offline that long, we'll definitely be catching that as, as right. a machine that we haven't seen, you know, we, we haven't seen it in 14 days, so the desktop support team responsible for that machine are going to be tasked then with, you know, track this machine down, find the user, and find out why, you know, is, is this you know, uh, one of a set of laptops that they have as an owner pool that's sitting in a filing cabinet or, you know. Right. And at that point, once they bring it online, it's then they're going to have to go through the process of, of getting itself caught up. And that, unfortunately, then it's going to be a race at that point. Like better like that. Like why didn't why didn't this this update go? And it's like, well, the servicing wasn't in place. So then you have to do that first, and then then the updates will go. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have not actually accounted for that that scenario. That's going to be gotcha. something I have to think about now. <laughs> gotcha. Luckily, the servicing updates don't require a reboot, so it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to think about how to, how we're, how we're going to handle that better. Thanks for pointing it out. No. Yeah. Any other questions? Mike, we really appreciate uh, you coming to present. Uh, it's huge uh, help for us. You, we got a we got a couple posts on uh, chainsaw or not chainsaws, but circular saws in the uh, chat there. If you'd like to check those out, but <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> oh, I am so sorry about that. I, you know, eh, no problem. No problem. Also, they hear the the table saw kick off, and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> That's just life, right? Yeah. 
so uh, I think you've been the one posting on uh, some road work in front of the house lately too, right? So uh, yep, you correct. Have some of that going on too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no, really, thank you a lot. Uh, really appreciate it. I don't know if anybody else would like to share anything on on just WAS in general and things they're doing, things you'd like to share along the way here as well. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, second the thanks to Adam Gross for his blog and and you know it helped me get feature updates going pretty much the same way and thankfully I had it all and functioning uh, before COVID hit the fan and um, you know because we've got a similar setup to Mike in terms of not always on VPN and um, no CMG and you know no Intune either so we're we're pretty much 100% on prem and. Uh, the VPN, the network guys do not want split tunnel or any of that stuff. Everything has to go back through the firm. And so this is what I got to work with. And so uh, I've noticed that changing from using a task sequence to using this feature update method has made compliance go up just immensely. I can push to say 500 machines and over the weekend, I'll probably get 450 of them. Whereas before, if I use the in-place upgrade, I probably only get about 100 to 200 of them. Nice. So it's definitely way better because my main thing is uh, the task sequence kind of needs somebody to be signed out. Whereas the uh, feature update method, because it's being pushed as a software update without a required reboot, um, it does all the, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, the backs, you know, the, the stuff in the background ahead of time so that the next time they reboot, whenever that may be, they're getting upgraded whether they want it or not. Down level, thank you. That's where I was looking for. Nice. Hey guys, this is this is Adam. Uh, just wanted to say thanks, thanks Mike for the shout out. Um, I'm totally, I, I'm working on a client right now that I need to steal your hash stuff from uh, for. So I'm totally gonna do that this week, hopefully. Um, but uh, good stuff. I'm I'm out working in the yard, and so I've just I've just been listening in. So, uh, but anyway, good job, awesome stuff. I'm gonna post a link to our. We did a feature update user group uh, a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago that Mike presented at, and so I'm gonna uh, post a link to that in the chat here as well. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Anybody else doing feature updates? Anything? Uh, any other good, bad, uglies questions? I, I was just kind of curious when you're going through this process, um, when the next update is available, what is the administrative overhead of prepping and getting ready for that one? It's not bad, really. Um, I've to build out all these collections and queries and deployments. I've I've scripted it all with a series of PowerShell scripts. Um, so, and and we're only going to be doing the the fall release at least that's that's our plan so to build everything out for 20h2 it's you know we'll go through uh, download the update we have to manually create the the software update group for the time being and then um, we just run the PowerShell script and tell it to build everything out for you know 20h2 it creates and has a you know uh, all the naming conventions and everything are all kind of parameterized so that you know it you know it, it builds out all the folders named properly and throws in all the collections and, and creates the queries and then it's just a matter of start feeding machines in so outside of getting the the, the feature update downloaded by hand and the software update group created by hand uh, the rest of its the rest of the creation is is automated okay thanks for, for me, um, we had um, started out with using the in-place upgrade tasting ones. We had CMG, but sometimes people were on VPN. The in-place upgrade tasting was run. Uh, users are at home. And then me monitoring the deployment, I would just see that it's still in progress because it got rebooted and then it didn't authenticate back to VPN. It was extremely annoying. So then I switched over to feature update method, and uh, that was really successful for me.
Mike, do you have the punt script available to download, or is that purely internal? Um, unfortunately, that's that's internal. Um, it's it's like this C sharp application that the the developer developers have written, and it's we've had it for years now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm great, sorry about that. Great presentation. Thank you. Just one comment here while we're still taking questions. I did post uh, on the on the share here. We're going to do a little raffle here in just a little bit. Uh, so feel free to uh, follow the instructions there to join the raffle. We'll, we'll wait a while longer here before we kick it off. Um, we'll op stay open here for more questions or comments. Hey, what, what, what version of Win 10 are you going um, coming from and going to? Um, primarily 1809. And going to 1909, uh, we do have some stragglers of, uh, of 1709 machines um, that we are um, also trying to bring up. But we have like a, a separate instance of this whole WAS branch spun off for them. Um, but primarily, we're probably about 95% of our machines are, are sitting at 1809 right now. Good. Any other questions on WAS? All right. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. We really appreciate it. Um, like, what great feedback here. Solid performance, right? We really appreciate it. Uh, this is very good information. So, um, if you'd like to share the deck, um, we'll we'll happily post it for you. If you can't, that's fine as well. Uh, but uh, oh, yeah, thanks no, for your time. Yeah, no no problem at all. I'll I'll get that emailed over to you. And yeah, no okay. problem at all. All right, great. Yeah, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, anytime. Um...